Thank you so much for welcoming and greeting each other. Appreciate that. I want to welcome our snowbirds back. The Ten Pennies are back with us. And thank you for bringing the warm weather with you from Arizona. It's, uh, it was a glorious, glorious day yesterday, and I'm excited that it's supposed to be nice today, and this week will be nicer. It's just something about nice weather that makes life a lot better. So, grateful for it. Uh, the other one reason I really love nice weather is that that means RC flying season has come back. And uh, actually, we were out there yesterday at our field being responsible and cleaning it up and setting everything up and getting ready so that we can go out there and not do that the rest of the year. And uh, it was a lot of fun to get together with the guys and actually got a, a flight or two in with one of my planes. And uh, it's just a wonderful time of year for us uh, RC people because we get to go out and fly, which is something we long for all winter long. And really, one of the, one of the things that's amazing to me about this hobby is we get new members and new opportunities. Is it really is a golden age of radio control flying. There's so many different types of models and price points that one can get into. Uh, there's this new development over the last, oh, I don't know, probably five to 10 10 years or so of, of electric flying setups so that you can fly with batteries and motors. It's a lot cleaner and nicer than uh, gasoline or fuel. But also there's new gasoline engines, which makes it a lot more affordable if you like to hear the noise on an airplane. Uh, one of the most important developments, though, over the last 10 years or so is the new development of radio transmitter technology. Uh, I've heard stories in the old days. You see, in the old days of, of RC, which the old days like 10 years ago, right? But you used to have to go to the store and you would buy a radio that had a dedicated channel that would communicate with your plane. And so you'd buy a transmitter that had that channel number and you had a receiver that had that channel number. And, and you put those in your plane, you would maybe have one radio, maybe a couple receivers, and that's what you would fly. The problem with that was, or the danger involved with that was, other people could have that same channel number. And so what was really important is, is if you go to any old, any, any flying field, and we still have these, although I don't know very many guys that use this technology anymore, there's these little clips that have numbers, 56, 25, I don't know what the actual radio channels are, but nonetheless, these little numbers on them. And the guy would take the number and stick it to his antenna, and the reason was, is it would declare to everyone else on the field, I'm flying channel 56, and if you also have 56, please don't fly until I do. Because the problem was, if a guy was flying his plane and doing his thing, and another guy had channel 56, and he got everything set up, and he started that plane, and got his radio on, and he did throttle tests and aileron checks, do you know what happened to the guy flying his plane? All of a sudden, he didn't know what was going on. My plane has gone haywire, kind of like our system today. It's gone crazy, because this other guy who's doing all this stuff is actually flying the guy's plane. And I hear great stories of legendary crashes and, and what the heck, my plane is out of control and crashing in the ground in spectacular fashion. And, and certainly that would happen if the guy didn't realize, wait, stop, turn it all off. So you'd have to play, wait your turn. Now with spread technology and all that, it doesn't matter. We can fly anything and everything all the time. It's great. So it's really important, though, to know what you're doing when you're flying a plane. And there really are many areas of our lives where it's crucial to know what are we supposed to do? What are, what is, what are we supposed to know about various tasks or responsibilities or relationships in our lives? You know, when it's our, in our jobs, it's crucial to know why we're there every day. What exactly is my job? Because I'm supposed to come to my workplace and do that job every day, it's really helpful to know that. I got fired once when I was in college. Was it the only time I got fired? Well, I guess laid off once too. Sorry, I'm a loser, I guess. But nonetheless, I was fired from this college job. It was a, a high-rise building, and I don't know why they hired me to begin with. But I got fired because the lady, uh, my boss, came in one day, and she said, you know, uh, you're not doing what I expected you to do. And she said, the stuff you do do, you don't do very well. And I said, well, I guess I didn't know what I was doing. And so legitimately so, I was, I was fired from that job. And it wasn't a huge loss to me, actually. I got to go work in a library and not be around people, which is ironic now that I'm a pastor. But nonetheless, <laughs> in college, it was a great life. Uh, in our family relationships as well, it's crucial to know, well, what's expected of each other? Uh, when it comes to chores, particularly, you know, what are, the, what are the sort of divisions of labor? I go out of my way to communicate to my kids, listen, there are dishes that need to be put away, Elijah and Millie. Millie, you do the silverware, and Elijah, you do the other stuff, and I would like for that to be done in a certain period of time. Or laundry, there's laundry that needs to be folded. Uh, please do that and actually fold it. Don't just stuff into drawers. It doesn't work very well. 
But we go out of our way, I go out of my way to communicate to my kids, this is what is expected and please do it and here's the time frame. So they know what they need to do and they can respond to that as well. Uh, one of the things I think that's so wonderful about being married is that I know that my wife loves me, I know that she wants to be with me, and that she cares about my life. You know, when we're dating, uh, maybe this is true for me, I know especially early on when I was dating her or other trying to date other ladies, uh, there was always this great consternation and fear if you called up, you set up a date, and they said, no, I can't tonight. And maybe they had a completely legitimate reason to do it, but it would send us reeling going, oh no, does that mean they don't want to be with me anymore? They don't like me? Maybe that was just insecure, which I was. But maybe you identify with that. But when you're married, what is absolutely sure? This person wants to be with me. They love me. They care about me. We can share life together. We can experience life. Uh, she wants to be with me, which sometimes I'm amazed at that. And so that knowledge that I don't have to worry every day, well, is she going to be here? Does she want to be with me? I know that's a settled matter. And so that enables us to be closer together, to develop our relationship, and to truly care for each other and have fun together and, and share our lives together. And really, I'm trying to talk here about what is important for us to know that enables our lives to flourish. And this is really important in our spiritual life as well. Because one fundamental question that is crucial to know the answer to is whether or not we actually have a relationship with God. It's an issue that the Apostle John addresses in this letter we're reading in 1 John and in his gospel as well, is because it's important for us to know whether we have a relationship with God. And so this morning we're going to see that, that John writes about how we can know that we're God's children how we can know that we actually have a relationship with Jesus. And it's one of the most glorious and beautiful and fundamental truths to our, to our faith is that God wants us to know whether we're his or not, because that changes everything about how we live this life, how we live in relationship with him. So I'm going to ask you to turn to your Bibles in, in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, the Pew Bibles, page 862. Uh, I wasn't expecting technical difficulties, so uh, I encourage you to turn there today. Particularly, there's going to be some other texts that you may or may not be able to get to fast enough. Maybe you could just write them down and follow up later on. You're always welcome to my sermon notes as well, if that would be helpful uh, in the future for you to, to think through and, and study God's Word uh, in your own life. So the first thing that John wants us to know, really two things we're going to see in this text. We're going to be looking at 1 John 2, verses 1 through 6 this morning. Is he really going to communicate two ways in which we can know that we have a relationship with God? And the first way is, is that we can know we have a relationship with Jesus because we're trusting in Jesus to forgive our sins. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, where we see John clearly state that Jesus is the one through whom we are forgiven and therefore can have a relationship with God. He says, my dear children, look at that warm address here. I care for you as spiritual children in my life that I love and I want to nurture and I want to encourage. And so he says, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. John begins and he says, my dear children, I, I'm writing to you and I want you to understand that I, I don't want you to sin. Uh, he's, he's writing to fellow Christian he cares a great deal about, and he's encouraging them, saying, listen, we need to live and fight against the sin and the temptation in our lives. I want you to know that it's possible for us to resist on a consistent basis. And so I want you to know, listen, I, I don't sin. I, I want you to not give in to this, no matter how hard the temptation, no matter what the excuses we might make, that listen, we, I want you to live without sin in your life. And it's an important statement because last week as we were studying this, we saw John confront those that deny the reality of sin altogether. And he says, that's spiritually dangerous. That is destructive. It means that we do not know God. And in fact, that we are deceived if we deny the reality of sin. And so look back a few verses in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, where here's what John wrote. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. John is writing and he's a realist. He understands the spiritual condition of our lives in our world and that Satan is real and he tempts and he's a good at it. And so he knows that sin is real and that people uh, are gonna struggle with sin. And he says, the answer is not to say, well, there is no sin. That will for all be free from and won't have to worry about it. He says, no, the reality is there is sin, but what we do with that sin is critical for how we live in this life and how we live in relationship with God. At the same time, I think someone could read those first few verses and accuse John uh, of saying, well, John, you seem to be just giving people a pass on sin and, and not making a very big deal out of it. And so John says that instead of denying sin and its reality in our lives, that we must confess our sin and we must seek God's forgiveness through Christ who purifies us from our sin. We saw last week that confession is the key to this. Confession is going to God and saying, I know what I have thought is wrong. It's not what your word says I should do. I know that it's destructive to you and to me and to the people in my lives. It's wrong. And I know what I have done is not right and I confess it. I admit it's wrong. I'm not making excuses that it might be right, but I'm just saying it's true. It's wrong. I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have thought it and done it. And Lord, I admit that's wrong. And implied in that is a desire to say, but Lord, I don't want to do it anymore. And I want to obey you and follow your ways and love you more and show you my love through how I obey you. But John says, it's not to deny sin. It's to acknowledge its reality. And when we do sin, to confess and be forgiven and purified because of it. But he goes on now in our text in John 2, 1 John 2, to say, listen, but we are to fight against sin. Not to just make excuses and, well, I'm going to do it, so I might as well give in. No, he says, I'm writing so that you won't sin. And we can have confidence that when we do, we are forgiven. And so last week, he makes the statement, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness or purify us. This week, he's explaining why it is that we are purified. Why are we cleansed? Why are we forgiven? And so if we look back at 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, we see how it's possible for us to be forgiven when we confess our sins. And the reason it's possible is that Jesus is the mediator. He is the one who speaks in our defense. He is the one who is the actual sacrifice that we needed to pay the penalty for our sins. And so he starts off, I write this so you will not sin, but... If anybody does sin, because this is the reality of the life that we live, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so this is a really critical theological truth that focuses us on the way in which we are forgiven. Remember, John starts off and he says, God is light. What did he mean? That he's perfect, he's righteous, he never sins. He always knows what is best and does what is best in this world. We, on the flip side, are immoral. We are imperfect. We are walking in darkness, the opposite of life. And because of our sin, which is an attitude that says, I want to follow my own ways and be God unto myself, and because of the actions and thoughts of our sins, we're separated from God. We're not in relationship with God. And we're not able to have this relationship with the perfect God because of the sin that has corrupted and separated us from him. And so this is why atonement is so critical. This is why the New Testament writers and the sacrificial system of the Old Testament were given to show us we need something to deal with sin in our life. And that comes from outside of us through God who works in us through Jesus and what he did. He stands in our place. So John says, listen, he is the one who speaks in our defense. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. But the way in which he forgives us our sins is he is the atoning sacrifice. This is why Jesus coming into the world is so important. He is God himself. Therefore, he can take the punishment for our sin upon himself as an eternal being receiving an eternal punishment for sin. He stands in our place as God to take the punishment for us. It's also so critical why he be human, that he can actually represent us. He can be our representative before God's justice. And so Jesus comes into the world, as John says, that he is the one who defends us before the Father. He is the one that makes forgiveness possible because he alone, God, man, can take the punishment, can represent us, and he can also give us his righteousness so that we are pure before God. 
And so John says, when we sin, Jesus speaks to God the Father to assure him and to assure us that because he is the righteous one, he is the only one who is able to make our atonement, he's the only one that can pay the penalty for our sins by sacrificing himself. And because he did that, we are indeed forgiven. We are indeed declared right and righteous with God and have a relationship with him. One of the things I think we need to be careful with when we read this, though, is to not think that God the Father is just sitting up in heaven and just waiting to smite us. That he's up there going, man, I'm going to give it to him. And Jesus goes, no! That's the wrong picture. That's not what we're talking about here. Jesus comes to our defense willingly to pay the penalty for us. He speaks to, or he is the representative for God to pay our penalty. And God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, in their eternal plan, their infinite plan to deal with the sin of humanity, however this works out, knew that the only way this was possible was for one of them to become the mediator. And they found joy and happiness and love in the midst of that. And so Jesus said, I willingly and want to come to be the, the, the sacrifice that they need. In fact, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, we're told that it wasn't out of God's anger that he sent Jesus, but it was out of God's love that he sent Jesus. 1 John 4, 10, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And how did he show that love? And he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The same word we see in John, 1 John 2 here. It's out of their love for each other. It's out of their love for us that Jesus came into this world to be our mediator, to be the one that makes it possible for a perfect, righteous God to have deep, true, eternal relationship with fallen, unrighteous human beings. So this is not an angry God with a big checklist and Jesus is going, no, I'm there. It's a God that understands the destruction of sin and how awful it is and the only way it can be dealt with is through someone of them coming into the world to die, to be the sacrifice we need. It's out of their love for each other, out of their love for us that they come, that Jesus came, that atonement, the proper sacrifice for our sins is made and we are graciously and lovingly forgiven and we're declared righteous because of Christ and we're willingly and joyfully brought into relationship with God. John also tells us that the only one that is able to bring about this atonement, this forgiveness, this restoration of relationship is Jesus. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, some have claimed this final statement, well, Jesus atones not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world means, well, that Jesus lets everybody in, that God lets everybody in, that everyone is saved. It's a universal forgiveness, whether or not people love or want to follow or know God at all. It just is a done deal. That's actually the opposite of what he's saying here. He's pointing out the reality that this God who came into the world as Jesus is the only hope for humanity to be able to have a relationship with God. And we need to understand the context that they are in is that their deities were, were, were localized. They were to, to specific communities and cities and nations and places and maybe even activities like fertility or crop growth. And so they had all these gods in their houses that took care of, of, of my ability to have babies and my animals to have babies and my ability to be successful as a citizen of this country or this people group. And they would do all their sacrifices to them. And the picture here that uh, John is saying is, no, Jesus is God. He is the one that makes the sacrifice possible. He is the only one in which enables people to have a relationship with God. And so it's not a sense of, oh, everybody gets in. It's a sense of, listen, this is the only hope we have. And it's an amazing, glorious, loving, amazing hope that God himself would come into our world to be the sacrifice, to be the one we needed to give us a relationship with God. And so since this is true, that it's only through faith in Jesus Christ that we can be forgiven and have a relationship with God, then the first way in which we can know we are God's children, that we are actually forgiven our sins, 
is to believe that Jesus died to forgive our sins. And so if you're here and you're questioning, well, am I a Christian? The place to start is to say, what do I actually believe? What am I actually trusting in? What am I actually hoping in? And if the answer is to come to a text like this and say, I believe that glorious truth that Jesus Christ is the only one that can be the atonement for my sins, that Jesus Christ is the only one that can pay the penalty for my sins, and that I must trust in what he has done, then you can have good confidence that you're a follower of Christ, that you're a child of God, that you are forgiven because he has stood in your place, he has taken your punishment, and you have looked to him and said, I want to receive that forgiveness. Not because I'm great, but because he is. And he has forgiven me. And so if you believe that, you can have confidence that you are a Christian. It's, it's similar to what Paul says in Romans 10, 9 through 10 and 13. He's talking about how is it we can know we're God's people, his children, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. The word justified means declared right and given a relationship with God. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, talking about Jesus, will be saved. So if you want to know if you're a child of God, the first place to look, and the most fundamental place to look, is to say, what am I trusting in to be forgiven? Is it Jesus? He's the only one? He's the only way God has given in which I can be saved? Then you have good assurance that you are a child of God. I want to look at kind of two ways in which I think uh, this assurance looks like in our daily lives. And it has to deal with what do we do with sin in our life. The first is this, that believing that Jesus forgives our sins by being the sacrifice for our sins means that we don't believe or we don't act like our good deeds or good thoughts make us Christians. Understanding this means that there's no room for this idea of self-righteousness or the idea that I'm good enough to earn God's forgiveness and approval. Jesus tells this beautiful and helpful parable about this complete dependence that we must have upon God's grace and mercy to forgive our sins through Christ. In Luke chapter 18, verses 10 to 14, here's what Jesus says. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And we need to understand Pharisees were the spiritual rock stars of their day. They were pious, they were righteous, they knew God's word, they wanted to follow it, they did follow it often. In fact, they made up all kinds of other rules that they followed because they seemed to be so concerned about God's ways. And so the other is a tax collector. Now, we don't like taxes. By the way, you gotta pay them on Monday. Uh, but, but the reality is tax collectors in their day often were viewed like traitors and evil men that signed, aligned with the evil oppressors of Rome. And often they were immoral and that they skimmed money off the top and charged more than they needed and lived very luxurious lives at the expense of others. This is the setup. Two of these men went to pray. The implication is, is wow, we're going to learn something from the Pharisee's prayer. And the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men robbers and evildoers and adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. And so the Pharisee stands up and he says, God, look how great I am. Not evil, not an adulterer, not robbing people. In fact, I keep even the most difficult parts of the law, like giving a tenth of everything to you. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Here's Jesus' conclusion from this. I tell you this, that this man, the tax collector who beats his breast and asks for God's mercy as a sinner, rather than the other, the Pharisee who stood up and said, look how great I am went home justified or declared right or in relationship with God. And his final concluding statement is, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So, so why is it that the Pharisee is not declared right or justified or brought into relationship with God? Because he trusted in his good deeds. 
Implied in this even is that he understands that maybe God helped him do those good deeds, but he says, this is what gives me a relationship with God. Look how great it is. And Jesus said, this man is not humble. This man doesn't recognize his sin. He doesn't recognize his need for God's sacrifice of atonement. He stands up and says, I'll stand before God on my own merits. I got this law thing figured out, a tenth of all I get. I'm not like robbers or evildoers or adulterers. I, I've done great. And God said he exalted himself and he's toast. He doesn't know me. He didn't go home in relationship with me. Yet, the guy that legitimately none of us would like, the guy that's got problems, who's really a sinner, who's messed up, but he knows he is. And he falls down before God and he says, Lord, forgive me. Have mercy on me. Mercy is a statement of, Lord, I don't deserve your help, but I need it. He recognizes his sin and he calls out for it. And Jesus says, that's the one who goes home in relationship with me. And so the way that we receive God's forgiveness is by acknowledging we're sinners who justifiably are facing God's punishment, but desperately know we need God's forgiveness through what Christ has done for us to pay the penalty for our sin. And so the first thing is to say, don't live like it's your righteousness that makes you right before God. Instead, always fall back upon the Lord and say, Lord, I need your grace, your mercy, your help to know and follow you. Secondly, believing that Jesus forgives our sins by being the sacrifice for our sins means that when we do sin, we confess and we repent of our sins because we know Jesus does forgive our sins and we accept, we receive that reality in our life. Back to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Notice whose justice and faithfulness. It's not ours to come and ask for it. It's God's to give it. If we confess, he is the one who is faithful and just to forgive us. And the reason that he is faithful and just to forgive us is because he knows Jesus stood in our place to take the penalty. It is paid for. We are forgiven. We have been given his righteousness, and therefore we are accepted. We are part of God's family at that point. And so we see this even more clearly spelled out in Romans 3, 22 and 24, where Paul speaks about how is it that Jesus gives us his righteousness and is the sacrifice we need. And he says, this righteousness from God that we need to have is we need to be perfect, but it comes from outside of us, from God. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And they are justified freely by the grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. And so what this means is, is that we understand it's Christ's righteousness, perfect man, perfect God who represents us, who gives us his righteousness. It's Christ's sacrifice that pays the penalty for our sins. And so practically what it means is that when we sin, we immediately turn to God and say, I have messed up and I know because Jesus has died for me, I am forgiven and I am declared right before you and I'm still in relationship with you and I want to follow and live for you. The other option, and it ties to what we looked at before, living like it's our good works that make us a Christian, the other option is to feel such shame and guilt and disgust at ourselves that we think, and I have done this many times in my life, and thankfully the Lord is teaching me not to do this so much anymore, but it's to just sort of wallow in it and say, oh, I'm so awful and so terrible, and look what I've done, and I need to, I need to treat my wife better today, and that'll show that I really want to change, and, and I, need to, I need to actually read my Bible a lot more, and that'll show that, God, I really want to change, and, and then I can come to God, and I can say, look, I've cleaned myself up, and I'm, I'm doing good, and you can accept me now. Folks, that, that shows that we're not trusting in Christ's forgiveness. How does he say we deal with our sin? We turn to him and say, I'm guilty. I'm sinful. And amazingly, and it's so hard to believe, you have forgiven me because of what Jesus did. And Lord, now I want your help to obey, to follow you, to receive your forgiveness. And instead of doing this, we can actually believe that when we confess our sins, we are forgiven and we can accept God's forgiveness 
and we can turn to him and find grace and love and mercy and help that, that next time we want to try to live apart from God's truth in ways that he'll help us and we can turn to him and I want to turn to him and we'll find greater help and motivation and encouragement to do that. This assurance brings peace to our hearts that we are in fact God's children and it actually brings God's power to us to receive his help and his mercy in our time of need. So far, what have we seen? That we can know we have a relationship with Jesus because we're trusting in Jesus to forgive our sins. Let's see the other way John says that we can know we have a relationship with God. We can know we have a relationship with Jesus because we love and obey him. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 6. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. John states very plainly here, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his command. This means that one powerful assurance for us to know if we are in relationship with God is to look at how we actually live our lives and to see if we accept what God says about himself, to see do we really know God, do we care about God, do we love God, and then to see, well, do I actually obey or follow God's ways in this life? And this is important enough that we're going to put this off till next week (laughs) because I've gone to town on the first part of this and that's good so next week we're going to pick this up and we're going to look at what does it mean to have assurance that through our actions how we actually live how we actually walk in this life that we can have assurance that we are God's children as well I'm going to ask you to pray with me as we end this morning Lord Jesus we thank you so much that you are the atoning sacrifice for our sins Lord, it is such an amazing, such a liberating, such a fantastic reality. Lord, help us that when we are tempted to look at the amazing love of Christ, the amazing love of God demonstrated in his willingness to come and pay the penalty for our sins, to see that his ways are so much better than any way we may give in to temptation. Lord, help us that when we do sin, to immediately turn to you, as John says, and know that we are forgiven when we confess, to know that you have purified us from all unrighteousness because of what Christ has done to be our sacrifice of atonement. Lord, may that amazing truth liberate us from shame and fear that makes us run from you And instead, may this amazing truth lead us to your throne of grace that we might find your help in our moments of need of temptation and sin. Lord, you empower and you enable us to obey. But Lord, it starts with the fundamental reality that we know we are your children because of what Christ has done for us. So Lord, we leave here today grateful and thankful for who you are. And what amazing grace and love you have shown us. And Lord, may it motivate us to love you, to want to know you more, to spend time with you, to be in your presence, to obey you, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.